Black monks, witches, and black clone research, the potential boogeyman when it comes to paranormal investigations. First of all, I'm not going to talk about I, any of them for a few minutes. I want to give a little bit of context to both this talk and the book launch today. Um, now, in 1977, the SPR <coughs> sent an inexperienced upper middle aged male investigator alone to investigate a poltergeist in the family home. He'd been given no training and had no prior experience. As luck would have it, he came in the shape of the highly professional Morris Gross, who soon, with the help of Guy Playfair, investigated the case of the Enfield poltergeist, which turned out to be the best documented case of all time. Um, Steve's also mentioned a couple of mistakes, at least these days they made along the way, but to a certain extent we got two good people there and we got lucky. Um, however, despite the outcome, the question remains, if simply looking like a sensible, well-educated gentleman or lady for that matter, is sufficient criteria these days to be referred unaided into a complex case. Now if you go a bit further back, any lapse in protocol with Enfield was minor. The investigator Nandor Fudder, for example, when investigating the Thornton Heath poltergeist, strip searched the potential victim. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, in 1909, the French Nobel Prize winner Charles Richet of the Institut Métaphysique Internationale instigated full body internal searches on mediums of the opposite sex. Now, I think we've got past that sort of thing. Um, but until fairly recently, any new protocol hasn't been written down in any detail. Groups have debated at length the new equipment, and we've heard a lot about that today and a lot of sensible stuff, but often the needs of witnesses have been forgotten. Now, ASAP, a nationwide investigation group, were perhaps the first to try to rectify this. And uniquely, their efforts in included gaining government accreditation as a professional investigation. Now, nobody's quite sure what this is, but so to give it some context, this technically put them in the same category as fairly well-known organisations such, such as APTA, the Association of British Travel Agents, less well-known organisations such as Bigger, the British and International Golf Green Keepers Association, and less well-liked organisations such as BPA, the British Parking Association of people that give you your parking tickets. Now the problem here is a lot of effort went into this, but none of these bodies, although they're recognised, have any legal footing. They're not like the Law Society or the British Medical Association. They're just internal organisations with their own internal rules. However, um, in addition, ASAP, also instigated an extremely helpful and at its time that kind of groundbreaking code of conduct. Now, that included some really useful things, such as not working in a case where somebody has been bereaved of a close relative recently, clients' right to an anonymity, that people <coughs> should come before research and that ideally investigators should not work alone um, and in sensitive cases of the um, investigators of both sexes are best. Now, it was good to have all this written down because some people have been following it, but some people haven't. So, so far, so good us up. Now, the SPR choice you've seen today is not um, at very much a tick box code of conduct as ASAP was, but a comprehensive right guide book which Steve has just introduced a few minutes earlier. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look through the book, um, we agree with nearly all of these aims. However, there is one point in which the ASAP, ASAP and the SPR totally disagree, which is really the subject of my talk. The issue in question being about background research. Now, ASAP recommends that you do not research 
the history of the property as part of working with a vulnerable client, <coughs> as there's no proven association between historical events and anomalous activity. Let's call that the no proven association argument. Now, if you look down to Steve's book, what we say is that researching the history of the location, the building, and people that have been associated with it may in some instances reveal information that's relevant to the investigation process. Now, as far as I can see, any healthy-minded sceptic, and we should all be healthy-mindedly sceptical, would agree that there's no proven association between anything as a definite cause of the paranormal. So to use ASAP's agreement, proven association agreement, is kind of an argument to do nothing at all. Now, I think that many people want to try and rationalise what's going on around them, and the more potentially relevant facts they have, the better. If people think their home may have the presence of an evil grey lady, or possibly a black monk, or possibly even a witch, so we get there in the end, and if research can show the likelihood or unlikelihood of any event, isn't that, I think, the essence of what we really are as paranormal researchers? Now, the Black Monk of Pontefract. What I want to do in the next two cases is show that research is really important. So the first interesting case is the Black Monk of Pontefract happening apparently quite unnoticed in the late 1960s in a road called East Drive in Pontefract, obviously. It didn't take, back, take place in a monastery, but in an average council house, not unlike Enfield, lived in by a family of four called the Pritchards. At the time, it barely hit regional news but it now makes claims to be possibly the most violent poltergeist incident in recent times. Now the activity involved an entity who was at first nicknamed Fred, which admittedly is a rather unclerical name. And it's ran its course as a poltergeist, not untypically in two stages, a first brief bout in 1966 and a second, more major bout in 1968. Now, it was only towards the end of that second bout that a man dressed in a long robe started to appear. Now, during this second bout, which is far the most interesting, there had a lot of traditional poltergeist um, incidents, drumming noises, pools of water appearing, drawers flying out of the cabinet, but it was a series of less typical incidents which gave this poltergeist its violent reputation. It included pinning Diane, the daughter of the Pritchard, to the stairs with a heavy hall stand, and in a separate incident, throwing a large grandfather clock down the same staircase. Now, a detailed account of this is found in Colin Wilson's Pull to guys, which, as you see, he thought it important enough for other reasons to include the Black Monk of Pontefract. So, if you want to find out this in detail, either read this or another book that might be out in nine months about Pull to guys by a certain John Fraser. But if you can't wait that long, um, Colin Wilson's book is very good indeed. Um, now, what makes a theory, this case, so interesting is the fact it was actually to change. Colin Wilson's whole theory of what poltergeists are. Now, that's a quote, the first bit's a quote from the book. Um, it quotes, the arm was being dragged up the stairs, a cardigan was stretched out in front of her as if Fred was tugging it, other hand apparently at her throat. In the light, they saw her throat was covered with red finger marks. Now, Wilson basically considered this afterwards um, and totally threw away his previous series of spontaneous um, psychokinesis 
on the basis that no psychologist would possibly want to drag themselves up the stairs. Interesting theory. I'll come back to it later. But how did Fred become a black monk? Now, this only happened about ten years later, when a researcher called Tom Kunif reviewed the case and spurred on by a description of the long-robed man explored the theory that the poltergeist might have been a monk. No ordinary monk, as it happens, but an evil 16th century monk who had been, who had been hung for raping and killing a child. Now, couldn't have based this on the fact that he did, he did in fact interview the poltergeist victim, so fair enough so far. But the actual theory was based on hearsay given to him by Mrs Pritchard, who had been told by the na a neighbour that there was a book in Pontefract Library that mentioned that a monk had been hanged for those reasons. Now, Cuniff also concluded that the Pontefract gallows were actually based at the time on the top of the hill where East Drive currently is, and that the place was also close to a place to a place called Priest's Bridge. <coughs> and based on Cuniff's research, Puvold Fred was totally forgotten, and the entire entity became known as the Pontifract Black Monk. Now, everything went quiet for about 30 years, as sometimes happens, but was resurrected when, in 2012, a chap called Pat Holden, who was actually a distant relative of the Pritchards, was to direct a low-budget movie <coughs> when the lights went out. Don't know if you've seen it. Roughly based around the instance of the um, old guys. Now, based on the Tom Cuniff's instance, it wasn't actually that inaccurate, apart from the Hollywood ending which they all insist on having. Now, Bill Bunge, who was a producer of the movie, was looking for ways to publicise it, found a house was for sale, bought it and held the premiere there for some lucky or unlucky competition winners, depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. And he was subsequently to experience phenomena in the house, decided the poltergeist was still active, and subsequently put it on overnight lets to paranormal teams. Now, through my interest in the case, I managed with um, Rosie O'Carroll as a ghost club, who I'm sure quite a few of you know, um, to make contact with one of those investigation teams and to get invited to stay at East Drive for the night. But that's not really what I want to talk about. Now, like most of these overnight experiences are sometimes an anticlimax, and phenomena wise, not really much happened. But what I really want to talk to you about. What I did is I actually went up about a day and a half early to actually have a look at this case that hadn't really been looked at since the mid-1980s. Now, Pontefract's actually a really interesting place. It's slightly run down in places, but still was a very historic and impressive historic town centre. It's also famous for Pontefract cake. Um, and now the interesting slant on this um, the reason for that, it was once surrounded by licorice fields, which gave Pontefract cake its flavour. Now, where it starts to get interesting is that Pontefract has no less than two prides. They're both now totally destroyed. There's a Clunic Priory of St John's, which, as you see, is now an open field with a sign up saying Clunic Priory of St John's used to be here. Um, now, and there's also the Dominican Friary of St Richard's, which is now in a uh, rather beautiful park. But, uh, and that was actually an open order that went around the countryside preaching in long black robes, and they were known as Black Friars. So, if there was going to be a poltergeist monk, it would almost certainly have been for the Dominican Friary of St Richard's. But these weren't the only two places. In addition to this, Pont Pontifact also has a hermitage. This was just the upstairs building. It's actually closed down now due to flooding, which I'll come to later. 
Um, the hermitage basically consists of hand-dug underground caves where monks used to stay in when they wanted a bit of space and privacy to pray. Now, this place was actually so famous, it was actually mentioned in Shakespeare, St John. Um, uh, so you start to get a picture for a town of only 28,000 people. Pontefract was absolutely, at one point in time, totally overrun by monks. This could be of interest when it comes to people's expectations. Now, the next morning I visited the archives of the local library. First thing I wanted to establish, now it's always very important to establish this, is that the case actually existed, because some cases actually really just don't exist at all. After a bit of research, I found an old press cutting, 12th of September, 68, Pontefract and Castleford Express, on the front page stating a headline, Invisible Hand Vox Family. Now, this article went on to explain the opening events of the second incident, um, including the grand grandfather clock falling down the stairs. Now, whilst the article was on the front <coughs> page, just to put it in context, it was very much a minor article. In fact, a lady winning £2,000 at bingo was seen as being far, far more important. Although, to be fair, £2,000 in 1968 was quite a lot of money. So you came to get the idea that, well, it definitely existed, but it didn't set the world on fire at the time. What also started to become clear from some old library maps was that the suburb of Pontefract called Checkerfield, where, the, where East Drive was situated, consisted basically just of licorice fields until the mid-20th century. If you look here, we've got a um, map. Uh, one is roughly where East Drive was. Um, uh, three I'll come back to in a minute. And two is Priest's Bridge close, which just show that Tom Cuniff was right. There was some kind of Priest's Bridge. They were not terribly close, to be honest. Um, now, this is a place comfortably outside the town centre, which is to your right, just off map, and not a logical place where they'd necessarily hang people. What was even more interesting, if you look at number three, um, right next to East Drive was actually quite an obscure building, um, a literacy hospital which um, existed in various guises from the 16th century onto the mid 20th century. In fact, it was the only building in the area at all. And Pontefract Library is very well resourced, lots of old books, including a very promising one, Black Fires of Pontefract by Richard Holmes, 1891, that absolutely no reference to the rape, to the hanging of a monk who raped a child. Next, I went to the local museum and who confirmed my doubts by stating that the actual hanging site was um, uh, in a place called Woolen Market, just outside what's now the Windmill Pub. Um, so we've got another dent in Cuniff's story. In addition, I managed to find in the museum archives, it's just like you think you're going to do lots of very difficult research, and then you find under P a great big thick box for paranormal. Having read through that, I found some references to the Black Monk, obviously, but to lots and lots of other cases as well. And it gave me the impression that for a small town in Pontefract, it does have more than its fair share of events, which might be interesting and I'll come back to later. Now, later in the afternoon, I went with um, my, my colleague Rosie, and in making inquiries, we discovered that Pritchard's had been members of the nearby Pontefract Sports and Social Club. Now, our intention of visiting it wasn't just our swift half. Um, we were trying to get some context into whether there were any elderly drinkers and how seriously the case had been taken, etc. 
that we didn't find any drinkers old enough to remember the case. We actually found that this random bar that we went to actually had a very active poltergeist case itself. Mm-hmm. Um, the activity including strange tappings in the dance floor and movement of empty beer glasses. Now if you add to that the, the um, thick library filled uh, with numerous other cases, you're starting to wonder if Pontefract and Checkerfield are just one of these places where strange things happen in clusters. Come back to that again, though. Now, the other thing we discovered from the library and the museum was that Checkerfield had a very bad history of housing subsistence. subsistence. See, um, they were built in the mid-20th century. Numerous articles, including... Um, including this one, um, uh, basically a thousand houses affected, which is probably most of Pontefract itself, sorry, most of the Checkerfield area itself. Now, I said earlier that Pontefract had been flooded with monks in the past, and we also discovered that there was a definite ghost monk that had been seen in living memory. Except that it wasn't at East Drive, but a black monk of Pontefract Castle, which was seen amongst others by Castle tour guide Michael Holdsworth, who stated that he saw a black man near the castle keep. He looked to be wearing an old wooden clothing and reading a scroll. Now that really is the ghost of a monk of taking at face value. Now, we also found out that Checkerfield and Pontefract is particularly liable to flooding. If you remember, the Hermitage is closed due to flooding, due to the fact that there's numerous rivulets um, running underground in the area. Now, it possibly makes for some interesting speculation um, along the theory by the writer T.C. Leatherbridge at field, Energy Fields and Water could be a factor in triggering clusters of paranormal activity. But that was always kind of speculative. Except just after I returned, somebody handed me this old um, cycle, um, uh, Journal for Psychical Research, June 1955. And first article I looked at was a very interesting one by Guy Lambert, um, Poltergeist of Physical Theory who'd actually taken 54 poltergeist cases and found that nearly half of those had taken place within three miles of tidal water. He also noticed that the cases that had a month of outbreak, which was number 33, 27 out of the 33 had been wet in the wintry half of the year. So you're starting to kind of get a connection between poltergeists and places that might be liable to flooding. I'll show this to anyone who wants to afterwards because it is actually quite rare to find. Then you've got an even more interesting little bit of evidence. Um, With regards to the identity of the poltergeist is the fact that we had numerous press cuttings indicating that the main researcher Tom Cuniff had aspirations to become a paranormal author and even had had a big argument with um, uh, Colin Wilson about his lack of um, his his lack of sort of not being mentioned in his book, um, uh, and you kind of get the idea that he might just have been wanting to push the paranormal monk thing a bit far. So the tentative conclusion I made about Pontefract is if you're going to have a ghost, a poltergeist, it's as liable to be identified as a monk as one in Romania is liable to be identified, say, as a vampire. And that happens a heck of a lot. If one's looking for an outside entity to be involved, it's far more likely to be an unfortunate leper in a bedroom who at the very least can be shown to have died in the immediate vicinity. Now, I also think this type of research helps show Wilson, Wilson's claims that this case somehow proves restless spirits is equally flimsy. I mean, he states in his book that Diane's subconscious, why would it drag her up the stairs? But isn't it equally more or more absurd that a once living spirit would just communicate in a destructive, senseless way without making any communications? Because once you take away the black monk, 
Fred is a non-entity, he doesn't communicate, doesn't say anything, just makes crashes and bangs for nine months. The most boring poltergeist you'd ever want to take down the pub. Um, and a poltergeist without personality doesn't back, back up the afterlife theory at all. Now, none of this nullifies the paranormal or non-paranormal nature, but gives a really important context. Nor is this a one-off case. It's what I like about research is it just gives you fascinating twists long after you spent the night at a place. Now, two years ago, I did a detailed study about an equally controversial case, the Cage St. Osephs, whose popular narrative was that it was an ancient holding cell who had imprisoned the famous witch Ursula Kemp prior to her being hung at Chelmsford. And of course, her spirit continued to haunt the place. That's the case in Tuzis, by the way. Now, whatever your views on the paranormal activity in the cage, and this personally I believe there's a good number of inexplicable events, but it is a controversial case, that's not what I want to talk about either. What I want to talk about is simply the logic behind the theory that any entity might have been the unfortunate Ursula Kemp. Now, first of all, Ursula Kemp definitely exists. There's several sources that go back to the witch trials. And it's possible she might have been kept at St. Sosa's village prior to her being taken to Chelmsford and hung. However, the specifics of her being kept in this particular old house seem to rest on two pieces of evidence. First of all, there was a skeleton dug up in the nearby houses in 1921, which was commonly thought to be that of Ursula Kemp. And there was certainly anecdotal evidence that her spirit may have been disturbed when a few years later the guy who had dug it up and put it on display at, I think, two pence a shot, had his own house mysteriously burnt down. However, when these remains were finally inspected, they were found to be of exactly the right area, and five foot eight, the one inconvenient thing was they happened to be male. But even more interest is the age of the cage building itself. Now it's long thought to be ancient, really based on the fact that there's a plaque in it that says it is. Can you make that out? Um, uh, it says Ursula uh, Kemp was, uh, was, um, uh, was kept there. Now, this plaque definitely goes back before the paranormal activity started, so it isn't a stunt or anything like that. Now, where it gets complicated is most local lockups only date back to about the 18th century at latest. There were functional buildings designed to hold thieves or drunks for a few days, not necessarily built to last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Let's look at this one, Bradwell Lockup, quite a nice little one actually, 1817 it was actually built. Now, when you actually look at an old photo of Cage, um, you actually see, actually just very briefly go back to the original one, if you see it's actually used to be separate from the house. Um, and it is a strange mixture of buildings. In fact, if you look at the little Citroen Diane in the background, it's L wedge, I think it dates that picture, not at 19th century or anything, but at 1975 to 1980. So, as long ago as that, the cage didn't have an upper story. The room above the cage is 1970s, early 1980s. Now, now while we've been trying to find out the age of the plaque and it remains unattributed, but at a wild guess, I would say it was put in after the conversion, late 1970s probably based on the hearsay from the skeleton. You know, they, everyone believes in the skeleton these days, so it's all just fitted together. 
No, it gets even weirder. Because you have to ask, so what's the age of the build, the building, the cottage of the cage, and the actual cage itself? Luckily, somebody sent me a couple of old maps. Now, you've got this one here. That's the king. The star is the, um, is the King's Arms pub. The other star is a little diagonal alleyway known as Coffin Alley. And the arrow is quite clearly showing the cage buildings and what have you. So that's 1897. But if you go back to Times Map 1839, you've got the um, Coffin Alley, little alleyway where the one star is. You've got the King's Arms pub that's well known to um, go back to the 17th century. And on plot 270, you don't seem to have much at all. So you've got, now these maps aren't, as you see, strictly accurate, but you've got the possibility that a 16th century witch's prison was actually built in the 1850s. Again, none of this distracts from the paranormal activity. But I think you're seeing a pattern emerging of things that can only be cleared up by research. Now, as a final thought on this tricky subject, I couldn't get help but get curious as to what other countries were having with regards to protocol and procedural conversations such as the ones we're having today. So I contacted, amongst others, the Institut Metaphysique Internationale of France, famous for having Nobel Prize winner and unethical body searcher Charles Richer is a member. But I did get a very helpful reply. Um, they actually um, explained to me they had um, produced very e easily measurable scales to help analyse reports of poltergeists and hauntings. It's basically based on five criteria. Um, the scale and intensity of the actual phenomena, how well authenticated it is, the scale whether it's concentrated in one person, the scale of psychological, you know, the impact it had on people, and the pathology scale and mental state of the witnesses. This is a direct translation from the French. So each category has a subcategory of one to four, and I just very quickly want to look at A and B, the scale of intensity of the disorder and the authentication. Now, if you look at the um, scale of intensity that can run nicely from having nothing at all, slight sensations to clash major disruptions, flyer stone veins, etc. Now, if you look at the phenomena in the cage, which only skirted over, um, but it did have a selection of poltergeist scratchings, it would just about fit in as a level four cases, although a lot of its activity would have been borderline three and four. The Black Monk of Poltergeist, as apparently one of the most violent poltergeists, would have a definite level for a, um, a grandfather clock falling down the stairs is definitely a heavy object displacement. While Diane Pritchard wasn't only moved but some um, met taken up the stairs and left with left with scratches, etc. etc. Um, however, if you look at the authentication scale, it's really a little bit more interesting in some ways. Now, whilst the cage has been quite thoroughly researched, it would probably be a level for a case with regards to authentication. Fields investigations with verified testimonies and anomalies by knowledgeable people, parapsychologists, etc, etc. However, Pontifact with regards to authentication would just be a level two collection of concordant testimonies of at least two people. As further verification um, by trained people didn't take place until at least a decade later, and anything that's happened recently hasn't been properly researched and recorded. Now, with a touch of refining, I believe these sort of categories could be re really useful protocol in making sense of our subject and comparing separate cases. Of course, the level, especially in the authentication scale, can only really be shown by research. To allow such comparisons, it's absolutely essential that both in a current case is researched and a historical case is re-researched. 
That's why I feel so strongly that on this one pilot point at least, ASAP is totally wrong and Steve and the SPR are totally right. I also think paran um, a guide is better than a tick box because there are so many variations to go through. So that's why I particularly like this. But that's just my opinion. Nothing in the paranormal is set in stone. So please feel free to disagree when it comes to the panel debate, especially, of course, if you happen to be a member of ASAP. Thank you. <laughs>